All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to First Friday's October edition for a conversation about where our food comes from. Uh, very happy to have you all here today for um, another First Fridays, our sixth in the virtual edition. So um, excited that you're still joining us for these online gatherings so we can um, connect and learn and discuss important food conversations in our community. Um, so I'm Megan Myrdal, one of the co-founders of Food of the North and co-host this event with Annie Wood and Gia Rassier. And we're um, super excited to have you to be here today um, for what is sure to be a really wonderful conversation with three awesome presenters. So for those of you who are new to First Fridays, very excited to have you here. Um, the intention of this conversation is really to um, give people a taste of some information um, about a food topic that you might know a lot of information about or might know nothing about. We invite people from our food community to each share a quick five minutes about what they know on a topic, and then we leave the bulk of our conversation for audience Q&A. Um, so you're, if you're looking on your screen right now, you should see a Q&A option at the bottom and would love to have you um, be typing in your questions as our presenters are talking because um, they're going to be sharing lots of fantastic information and if you type your question in there we'll be sure to answer it um, throughout the conversation. Um, in addition to that I've seen some people already taking a little time in the chat option um, to say hello and welcome and introduce yourself. Um, please also um, if you haven't done so please um, feel free to connect on there. It's a great space to, um, to chat with some folks and, and learn more about um, each other as well. Um, so before we launch into our program today, um, we have an announcement this morning from um, Jenny Mojo. She is a member of the Casclay Food Commission and a Casclay Food Commissioner. And so we co-host our First Fridays event with the Casclay Food Partners. And so it's always really great to hear what they have going on and what's happening in that part of our food community. Um, so with that, I'll ask Jenny to um, turn on her video and off mute and give us a little update. Thanks. Uh, Megan, I can't undo the video. It said you've disabled it. There we go. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me again. What a great opportunity to have some pretty um, fun discussions on a variety of topics. Uh, the Cascade Clay Food Commission uh, had some meetings in, over the summer. We've really been working hard about talking about the food supply chain breakdown that we have all witnessed and experienced Experience since the start of the pandemic. So we're really working hard to make some connections there. Uh, we talked about, um, we had a presentation from Megan and the Food of the North's work. We also had a presentation on pesticide use on school grounds and the community. Uh, so we have kind, kind of taken a month to re-examine that and look at that and, and talk with our network leaders and we'll be working for possible action on that at the November 4th meeting. Um, uh, so I invite you to take part in that November 4th meeting that's at 1030 and um, the pesticide will be looking at that snapshot again for approval and then we'll work at having discussion about future directions of the work based on uh, community input. So thanks again for having me and I look forward to this discussion. Awesome. Thanks so much. Before you unmute Jenny, um, for folks that want to attend that meeting, is there a virtual option or is it just in the City Commission Chambers? Right. I believe we're still virtual options. So if you go to the Cass Clay Food Partners webpage, there will be a, a link there as well. Fabulous. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, Jenny. All right. So now for why you are all here today to um, have a fabulous presentation from these three um, wonderful folks. So um, prior to COVID-19, Many of us were likely blissfully unaware of the complexities of our US food supply chain. We would go to stores and get whatever we needed whenever we needed it. However, as headline after headline emerged showing the shelves barren of staple food products, farmers forced to euthanize animals, or thousands of gallons of milk being dumped down the drain, many of us began to wonder why this was happening and what we can do to change it. In response to these issues, businesses, organizations, and individuals have pivoted, pivoted their usual way of doing business. For some, this has meant reducing product offerings, 
For others, it's required identifying and building new supply chains, um, some that are local and others that are across the globe. And for some, it's meant rethinking how we grow and source food and encouraging individuals and communities to develop a more personal, resilient food system. For our October edition of First Fridays, we are excited to welcome three speakers to share their unique experiences and expertise on the U.S. food supply chain. Dr. Bacola Bakari is an assistant professor at Western Carolina University and a former Robert Wood Johnson health policy research scholar. Her work and research focuses on operations and supply chain logistics that improve health. While completing her PhD at North Dakota State University, she was a member of the Casclay Food Commission and initiated projects that provided raised bed gardens to food insecure residents in our community. Meredith Wagner is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Nutrition, Dietetics, and Exercise Science at Concordia College in Moorhead. She also serves as the director of the Combined Dietetic Internship Masters of Science in Nutrition program. Dr. Wagner's courses have students exploring ways to improve the food supply chain to promote good nutrition and better health. She is also a leader in the Concordia's Taste Not Waste campaign, which aims to reduce campus food waste. And finally, we have Tim Rohde, a store director for Corborns Inc., a company based out of St. Cloud, Minnesota, that owns the Hornbachers and Cashwise grocery stores in the Fargo-Moorhead community. Corborns operates 120 retail locations and has more than 9,000 employees. Tim has worked for Coburn's and the grocery management for over 30 years. And in our community, he also serves as the board member for the Emergency Food Pantry. So as you hear, we have a stellar lineup for presenters that are gonna share a wide variety of experiences. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Meredith Wagner to kick us off this morning. Meredith. Thank you, Megan. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, just a little bit about me. I've loved food for a long time, essentially as long as I can remember. I grew up in a household with two parents who both loved to cook and they involved both my brother and I in that process. Uh, it was so fun to utilize all my senses, sight, touch, smell, taste, um, as the food transformed throughout the cooking process. We had a garden each year, so we were able to enjoy the produce we grew. I also had an aunt and uncle who lived on a farm just 30 minutes away. They raised cattle and chickens and grew wheat and other crops. Um, I remember distinctively going to their farm for butchering chickens and got to see the whole process from start to finish. So it was really through those experiences of having a or having a garden, vegetable garden, and then going to my aunt and uncle's farm that I really learned about where food comes from. Then as a food nutrition and dietetics major at Concordia, I learned about topics ranging from the US food supply chain all the way to how we, our body breaks down food and uses the nutrients it provides. As a practicing registered dietitian nutritionist and as a college professor, I see firsthand how people relate to food and how their knowledge of food, including where it comes from, varies considerably. And this in turn can impact their overall health. So when discussing the food supply chain, it's important to understand that it is a system. And a system can be defined by Merriam-Webster as a regularly interacting or interdependent group of items forming a unified whole. So key factors in a healthy and sustainable food supply chain or food system include that all components are present and arranged in a particular order, that the components are functioning properly, and that there is interaction between the various components. Any changes, even small ones, to one component of the food supply chain can have a domino effect on the rest of the supply chain. So when discussing the food supply chain or system, we're referring to growing, harvesting, processing, packaging, transporting, marketing, consumption, and disposal of food. The food supply chain includes inputs needed, such as water, energy, equipment, and outputs generated, such as grain, produce, and waste at each of those steps along the chain. 
The food supply chain operates within and is influenced by social, political, economic, and natural environments, as some of the other panelists are going to discuss today. I'm going to focus on how nutrition and health are tied to our food supply chain. To do so, I have a case study that I hope illustrates the connection. Let's say we have a gentleman, and we'll call him Dan. Dan struggles with high blood pressure, and he is told by his healthcare providers that he has to limit the amount of sodium he consumes and increase his intake of fruits and vegetables. So we'll start with sodium. Sodium is an essential nutrient and a component of table salt. So table salt is sodium chloride. Sodium also functions as a preservative, so it is often added to foods in the processing step of the food supply chain to ward off spoilage as the food continues through other steps of the food supply chain, including sitting on the shelf at the grocery store until it's purchased and consumed. By Dan knowing about the food supply chain and that sodium is added to numerous foods to prevent spoilage and extend their shelf life, Dan can more easily identify and select foods that are less processed and thereby contain less sodium. Dan is also encouraged to consume more fruits and vegetables to help with his high blood pressure. But Dan is concerned because fruits and vegetables in the Midwest can be expensive, especially during the winter. Fortunately, Dan can watch the recording of First Fridays at B event titled Gardening in Fargo-Moorhead, during which he will learn what fruits and vegetables grow well in this particular region. He can then create and contribute to his own mini food supply chain by planting a garden in the summer, harvesting that produce, and then freezing the fruits and vegetables to enjoy throughout the winter. By doing so, Dan is influencing the food supply chain and helping to promote his own health. So now that we've learned about Dan's situation, let's look at the broader picture. Nutrition and health efforts at the national level have generally focused on improving the diet and food consumption of individuals. So essentially it's focused on the consumption step of the food supply chain and not on the overall food supply chain. This continues to occur despite it becoming increasingly clear that the dietary guidelines for Americans and other national guidelines and goals related to nutrition and health cannot be met without focusing on the food supply, the overall food supply chain. By increasing our personal knowledge of the food supply chain and understanding how we can influence that chain, we are on a path to improving our overall health as well as the sustainability of the food supply chain. I challenge all of you to examine your food supply chain, specifically at a step other than just the consumption level, and engage in practices that support both a healthier overall food supply chain and a healthier you. So with that, I will turn it over to Tim. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk a bit about just my experiences and what the grocery industry itself is going through with um, influence from the pandemic. Um, I've been involved with the grocery industry basically all my life. Um, I've worked in grocery stores since I've been in high school. And um, this pandemic has been um, unprecedented as far as like how it affects the industry and our ability to supply the general public with what they need to purchase for their homes. Um, much like everyone out there, um, we're watching the national news as this started to unfold, um, trying to predict where it might lead us and how it might affect um, food supply, things like that. And it first started with um, just some panic buying in stores. So I think everyone has heard about the toilet paper shortage that happened. And that was probably one of the first categories that got um, decimated as this pandemic started to really um, gain public attention. So basically, in my location, for example, um, we ordered in roughly a, a truckload of paper and it was gone within a day and then we started to see that same influence kind of throughout the store um, we saw that people were um, grabbing anything that they could hold in their pantries for periods of time um, so like canned proteins pastas sauces things like that that they could hold in case um, there became a, a much deeper crisis and they weren't able to get the food that they needed for their families so our team started to react by 
ordering heavier throughout the store to try to refill things. And once the schools and the restaurants were shut down, we were basically the only food supply that was available to the general public. So um, we saw some massive out of stocks that we're not used to. We set industry standards and um, facility standards to be at about a 97% fill rate. So that means about 97% of the products are available to the general public at all times. And that fell dramatically to probably even below 50%, especially in the center of the store. Um, team members um, also became a bit concerned just with how um, the pandemic was announced in the public, but we were working in the public, very, very public. Um, we had implemented some cleaning procedures right away where we limited our store hours uh, which allowed us to do some deeper cleaning in the evening hours and we were cleaning between guests just to try to um, ward off following CDC guidelines and things like that to make sure that we're protecting both our staff and our the public that we serve. We did have a number of employees um, opt out. They didn't feel comfortable or they had underlying health conditions um, and as restaurants closed it, there was a large group of people that didn't have employment. So what Coburn's did as a step to help both ourselves with our volume increase and the general public that was displaced from their place of employment was we brought on quite a number of temporary um, employees. So we, my location itself probably employed about 30 temporary team members that helped us with everything from stocking our shelves to online shopping, which skyrocketed during this uh, early stages of the pandemic. It basically went up by about 1,500%. Um, then what the next phase was, it kind of broke my presentation down into three phases, was the um, manufacturers started to experience COVID problems. So as they tried to implement safety measures to protect their team members from COVID, um, it slowed their production dramatically. Um, so there were some plant closures, there was facility slowdowns because of COVID. And then um, with the general pipeline being emptied out, what they did is they cut variety. So Bush Beans, for example, offers about 28 varieties and they cut their production down to just their top five, just to get something on our shelves. There was an aluminum shortage that happened in the soft drink industry. So the, um, soft drink companies needed to cut their variety as well. So they wanted to stay in business on their core products. So they started to drop their lesser known brands or as the brand extension, they started to cut those back so they could just make sure that they offered like their top few varieties. Next was a coin shortage that popped up. So um, the mints were basically shut down. So their, um, we moved to things like uh, self checkouts, going to cash or to credit only, debit only, and we implemented a program where we rounded up or provided the guests the opportunity to round up, and then that money would be donated to the local food pantries, um, all to preserve coin that we were not able to get from the banks. Meat industry was heavily impacted, especially the, the smoke meat section of our departments, um, lunch meats, hot dog sections. Um, those are heavily processed items and that area of our department was impacted the greatest, fell to below 50% fill rates. Fresh meat was affected initially, especially like chicken. So we needed to take a step back and order bulk chicken where we were doing some of that cutting ourselves, repackaging ourselves just to get that protein back on the shelf. Um, that area was basically able to recover much quicker we're still feeling the effects in the smoke meat area of our departments. It's probably up to about a 60% fill right now. In March, we began uh, mass for our employees. Um, our company felt that that was probably the one of the best ways at that point to protect our team members. And there was actually, we could get our hands on enough uh, supply to do that for our employees. So we provided masks and required them to wear them. And in July, we required our guests to start. And basically, it was a, the supply chain had to catch up. Those 
products were unavailable to us for a period of time. And when they did become available is when Tobin's decided to make that move to make masks mandatory. During those stages, we, we did see some of the restaurants start to reopen. We did start to lose some of our temporary employees. They went back to their regular jobs. Um, there were a fair number of restaurant employees that worked for us. There was a fair number of school teachers that worked for us. Um, and then they began to find their way back to their regular um, employment. Our, where we're standing today is some of our suppliers are still lagging behind, but our, our shelf conditions are much better. Um, I would say that if you walked our center store aisles, you know, we're probably above that 70 to 80% fill rate on the shelves. Um, there's some categories that are still being affected. Um, as of this morning now, we finally have some of our Campbell soup varieties back that we've been waiting on basically for the entire summer. Um, so that section is looking much better. It's probably been one of the slowest to recover. Soft drink companies have been able to add some of their lines back in. Smoked meats are still probably just at 60%. Um, we're hoping that that continues to creep up little by little. Um, Frozen pizzas has been heavily impacted with people at home and kids at home. Uh, frozen pizzas are probably at about 65%. Our suppliers have done a good job of keeping our ad items in stock, but um, they do occasionally have problems where you'll see a production line go away, so you'll see certain varieties not available. And then just with the continued cleaning in our store, we've had basically most of our employees return to work. Um, knowing that we're doing everything we can to help protect them and the general public um, with the cleaning procedures and things that we've put in place. And that kind of sums up where we're at at this point. All right. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, and with that, we'll pass it over to Bacola to wrap us up for our presentation. Bacola, if you'd like to turn your video on and get started. Thank you. All right. Thank you, um, Megan. <clears throat> All right. So um, I really appreciate Meredith and team. Thank you so much for what you have presented. I'm going to come from a little bit different angle with food sustainability and individual, individualized food distribution and supply. And with this one, um, Food is a journey. Having access to food, to the kind of food that your body wants or that you'd like to have at any time will be a journey. So taking the journey to grocery stores, taking journeys to, um, to go plant your own food, whatever kind of ways you get your food supply is a journey. And every journey begins with the first step. So with my presentation today, I'm looking at how we can um, begin to look at ways that we can have food access um, re reliance. I mean, re food access by ourselves, like you plant your own food and things. I, I cannot move my slide. <laughs> okay, let me try this one. Okay, so the issue is that during the pandemic, you will all know that it was very difficult to get access to food. Like I would go to Walmart and I won't be able to get, get fresh uh, lettuce or Brussels sprouts. So access during the pandemic was a big issue. So for me, I'm looking at lack of information to be one of the catalysts for why some of us could not have easy access to food, especially fresh produce during the pandemic. And I know Tim talked about other supplies, how household supplies. So we know that we learned lesson during this pandemic. Imagine that we are not reliant on these um, food supply stores to gain our food um, supply. Imagine that we don't have that reliance, but we have an assurance during the pandemic. How can we have this assurance? What kind of assurance can you have to have your own food supply within your own um, environment or means? Okay, so the idea and the goal is to have a culture of food proximity where we begin to think, think outside of the box of just 
the way we've done food for a long time now. Um, just going back to the basics of how can you have your own little supply of food just in case of things like pandemic or things like you just want to eat locally. You want to have fresh food that is better for your body instead of food that are coming from say Mexico or um, even places like Asia. So you want to be able to have food proximity and food security within your own community, within your own environment. So, and we all know that healthy um, living begins with healthy foods, having access to healthy food, right? So how can we achieve this? What are the steps that can be taken? So we want to talk um, in this group about self-manage, self-directed, sustainable agriculture. How is that possible? I'm gonna talk about that in just a bit. Then my kind of model is food logistics model where we have destructive um, supply, food supply chain. Like we have, for example, Uber is a destructive um, supply, transportation supply. We have Airbnb is a um, destructive um, supply of accommodation, right? Why can't we begin to think about food in such a way as well? So why and how? So gain access, you know, when it comes to food supply chain, take the law into your hands, grow your own, grow yours, vegetables, fruits, herbs, in a portable plant, uh, planters, you can preserve food. In the old times, people have preserved food for a long time. Imagine that we don't have technology that we have today and we are in the middle of a pandemic. People will go into the um, cellar or basement or wherever they will bring out food and they will consume food. You can plant it in your balcony, patio, or even on the streets, right? We have spaces that are not being used. You can get your um, city council to give you access. Then have food exchange programs or food bodies where you can exchange food and all that. Imagine that we have excess food and we can supply the schools as well. So affordable, available and desirable food is what we need. And we need to be thinking outside of the box of that. Imagine that you have excess, access food, you know, excess food to supply to school and kids can eat fresh. They can have greens and multiple colors in their plate at school. We can make that happen if we all put our hands on the deck. So remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So I would like to give credit to my crew. We've done projects in the Fargo Mall Head where we supply um, planters, portable vegetable planters to families in the Fargo Mall Head. I would like to continue that and I'm open to the ideas that you have um, for us in this forum. We will want to continue that in a, um, in a bigger scale. All right, so that's all I, that I have today. Thank you, everyone. Fabulous. Um, thank you so much, Bacola, Tim, and Meredith for that wonderful presentation. I'll ask all of our um, presenters now to um, please unmute yourself and turn your um, microphones back on. And we will go ahead and jump into the Q&A portion of our program. Um, so again, this is the time where you as audience members can ask questions of these fabulous folks. Um, Bacola, if you'd like to turn your um, video and turn your microphone off as well, that would be, um, that would be great. Um, so I just wanna reflect for a moment. I think that each of you shared such unique and different perspectives on the food supply chain. Um, and it was really fascinating to kind of hear Meredith's focus on nutrition and health, um, Tim's perspective actually working on the front lines of the grocery store and what it means to actually keep those shelves stocked with food. And then Bacola kind of talking about this idea of potential disruptors and how we can create this more individualized approach um, to um, managing and controlling our food supply. Um, so uh, thank you so much for those different perspectives. Um, so I'm just going to dive into our first question that's come in through the Q&A. And again, for those who are listening out there, please, um, please just keep typing them in there and we'll keep going through them. Um, the first one comes from Steve Lindos. Um, food preservation, 
Supplies are short of freezers and fridges and canning lids. It's more difficult to learn about food preservation methods if classes are canceled and you don't have access to the internet. You already mentioned a whole host of other hidden system elements. How do we get all the parts of the system recognized and prioritized? Um, wow, that is a great question. Um, do any of you feel that you have a, an idea or a response to that at this time? <laughs> Steve started us with a real uh, um, uh, a, a challenging one there. Um, I can I, I can share a couple of thoughts or perspectives on that um, just from some of the work that that we do through Food of the North. You know, I think one of the first challenges you think about with this is um, I, well, one thing that I think is interesting from the pandemic perspective is that I think it's motivated people on a different level than we've ever seen before, right? So people that kind of, I said it in the intro, were blissfully unaware and you'd go to the grocery store and you'd get what you need and you'd move along, have started to examine more closely. And Meredith alluded that to that too, right? That getting people with a higher level of understanding of what is this food supply chain and how do these different elements fit together? So now that we have the motivation for people to be there, um, you know, the internet is an amazing source of information. I know that our public libraries have done a lot to try to make information more accessible and available. Um, and then I go back to my days with the extension service, which was the initial arm of our US government that extended that information out into communities and taught people those techniques. And I know when I was working for extension and my colleagues that still work there, the rise of interest in people that want to have those classes and want to learn just continues to grow. Um, so I would say that we need to, um, as individuals, help those organizations share what they are doing and share what they have happening. Um, just a, a little information there. Um, with the funding that comes forward for extension, they don't have funding to promote themselves. It's kind of one of those weird things where how government funding works, they can pay for their supplies, they can pay for their people, but they can't market. Um, so I think that um, we can maybe advocate for that as individuals to try to help them to say in 2020, these organizations aren't going to exist if people don't know they exist. So we need to think about those um, funding models and how they're able to promote themselves. Um, so my long rambling answer is now over. Um, anyone else like to chime in before we move on to the next question? I'll just um, excuse me, add a little bit um, to Megan's comment. It's just, I think a silver lining in this pandemic is that it really has encouraged lots of people to right, kind of get back to that roots of like, where does food come from? And how do you engage in cooking and you know, growing your own food and things like that. So what I hope will happen is that we won't just let this kind of go away with, you know, as the pandemic kind of resolves itself, um, is that we will continue to support extension in those services and get a larger generation of people who do understand where their food comes from and do understand food preservation. And as the COLA mentioned, you know, do take kind of that initiative to sort of contribute to their own food supply chain. So. I, I think it's an exciting sort of return to maybe things in the past, so. Absolutely. I would, just to add to that, um, my observations in the grocery store where this is probably one of the first years that we really sold out of garden seeds. Um, canning supplies also, um, one of the first years that we, we sold out of those products very early. So I think people really are paying attention to what's going on and they had more time they were at home, so they were able to um, do home improvement projects, uh, plant a garden. Um, those are things that they probably didn't take time to do in the past. We saw guests in the aisles with recipes. They were taking time to bake their own bread and things like that that they um, hadn't really done to that extent in the past. So I think that it'll leave uh, this pandemic will leave a lasting mark on the public and how they look at how they handle their homes and where they where they choose to get their food from. Absolutely. Um, kind of pivoting off of your comment, Tim, about folks in the grocery store and with their recipes and making different items. One thing that I've heard some folks comment on from the grocery store perspective, um, you know, some of the items that were missing in the stores was flour and sugar. Um, and just thinking about our regional food supply chain, 
We look out in the fields and we see sugar beets and wheat growing. We've got the North Dakota mill in Grand Forks and we've got American crystal sugar plants um, that scatter the region. And some people were wondering why of all places would we not have those items in our store? So I wondered if you could just share a little bit about how those items end up on your shelves and why it isn't just, it's right here in our region. It just gets directly to our stores. We, we were somewhat fortunate there um, because of uh, Dakota Made Flour and Crystal Sugar being in the region. They pack a lot of products for us between those two and then Dakota Growers Pasta. Um, so we were able to maintain probably a little bit better than some of the um, retailers further out of our region. But um, other ingredients like yeast became an issue. Um, those uh, those companies did a good job of keeping us at least in business on some label. Might have not have been the label that we were used to purchasing. Um, we had to get a little creative as far as like what we were putting in our store, and we had to accept certain products into our store that we weren't used to purchasing. But then some of those core items became a lot more challenging. We probably sold five years worth of yeast in about two months um, with everyone uh, baking at home like they were. So. It, it took us a while to recover on that particular item in that category. And then there was, there's probably examples all through the store of little things like that that we struggled to um, get back in supply on. Wow, five years of yeast in two months. That's amazing. <laughs> um, Bacola, I was interested when you were talking about, um, you know, encouraging people to have this more um, personal um, kind of building up that, that ability of individuals to grow their own food. And from your perspective on, you know, transportation, logistics, development of that local food system, what are your thoughts on communities investing in greenhouses and high tunnels, um, particularly for folks like us up in the northern climate um, to increase fresh food supply? Yeah, um, so I, what I'll say about greenhouses is that, um, we know that there's some part of that that some people are not really, um, they don't really agree with because of the, you know, the environment with greenhouses, with issue with um, emitting um, greenhouse gases. So, but I would, I know that there are sustainable ways to do that these days where we can have community come together because some people may not be able to have the time individually to um, get to plant their own food or very close to their house, but they can join um, community gardens, they can join um, or they can be part of the um, greenhouse where we have a very close to um, the community to people where they can go to to get their food supply. So um, I'll say that is an aspect that is okay but I will specifically advocate for where people learn to be um, to grow their own food by themselves in other ways that are not just um, industrialized. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, we know that yes, we've come a long way with um, so, uh, food supply chain through you know this um, through um, uh, retail stores. But we could help even teams, like Team Store, if a lot of people could have supply in their home to some extent to supplement um, what we could get from the stores, then that would be great. But um, I hope that answers your question. But what I'm trying to say is that, yes, uh, it's possible to have green outfits and all this other stuff, but I would advocate more for when mm -hmm. people come as a community um, to grow food. Um, that are more sustainable, more natural than, you know, um, I, I know it's, some people may say it's not possible, but I know it's possible. We just have to be thinking in that direction. Yeah. I was just having a conversation with someone about this the other day, and it's really, a, um, it'll be interesting. I see we have a question coming up on this too. You know, individuals devoted a lot more time to food during the pandemic, thinking about food, preparing food, um, and a lot of folks planted gardens, as Tim mentioned, selling out of seeds. Um, if some of those habits will stick around after the pandemic and that will continue that commitment after this passes. Um, 
We have a question from Chris Olson. Since food service operators are generally seeing lower sales numbers, how can these large pack size items get into consumers' hands aside from club stores? Um, which is a really great question. You know, these large volumes that came in certain packaging that were intended for that volume food service auto, and it's like the restaurant and the schools. Um, do any of you, um, this might be directed to Tim, but Meredith and Bacola, if you have ideas um, about repackaging and resizing those items so that they are more tailored to the household size versus the volume size. So was the question more towards they're looking to purchase those larger size items or just exactly. what to do with them once they do that? Um, I, I would say let's let's think about purchasing those items. Is there, I guess in my mind, has um, grocery stores thought it been able to acquire those items and repackage them into for sale options for, for patrons or I'm just curious if there's other ideas? Um, we probably haven't, explored repack repackaging items like that, we probably just more or less look for ways to purchase them for our guests to, to buy them in those larger quantities. Um, obviously the club stores, that's the, been their niche for some time. They've built their business on that. We've looked to add family size options to our stores just to be a stronger competitor, to offer more things to our guests, to be that more attractive place to shop. Um, so we have, worked extensively on adding institutional sections in our stores, um, different items throughout um, many of the categories in our store just to offer those larger sizes that are popular with certain guests that shop with us. But probably not done much for us like repackaging, just in our general departments. Um, maybe things like in our deli areas and things like that. We've done some of that type of work just with what we offer there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I've heard a lot of conversation about that, you know, and, and as Meredith was kind of talking about the system and that each piece of the system is so well defined, um, how the food system pivoted in that moment from these volume orders to the smaller orders. And that was probably, I'm sure at the higher level of our food system, there was a lot of adaptations that were happening to try to figure out how to do this um, repackaging. And unfortunately, at the start of the pandemic, we saw a lot of items um, going to waste because unfortunately, um, per particularly those perishable items, they weren't able to make the, the switch right away. But um, just from some different webinars I've sat in on, it sounds like there's been a lot of conversations amongst the major food manufacturers in terms of um, increasing their flexibility and adaptability um, to make switches like that, but um, very interesting. Um, I want to make just an observation and then something that I'll ask you guys to react to. So Meredith and Bacola, you talked a lot about um, the healthfulness of our food supply chain and thinking about increasing access to healthier, fresh foods um, to promote good health. And then as Tim was chatting and sharing with us what we saw during the pandemic, people really relied on those pantry shelf stable items. Um, and bought those in great quantities. And we know that there are healthy options within those center aisles, um, but then there are also a lot of um, salt-laden, sugar-laden, fat-laden products in there too. And so um, I guess just kind of curious in terms of your observations, in terms of how do we continue to think about health and promoting health and encouraging folks to make good options when there is concerns about stability and, um, and, and, and keeping up a, a personal, safe, healthy food supply. Um, uh, Meredith, if you wouldn't mind starting with that. Sure, <clears throat> excuse me. I think there are, right, I mean, it definitely is a challenge and it certainly became sort of at the forefront with the pandemic. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is that even among shelf stable items or foods that can be preserved maybe in a freezer, for example, is to really kind of focus on that variety piece and nutrition. We really talk about trying to consume a variety of foods and while we may not have the fresh options in a situation like this, you could still have a bag of frozen, you know, fruits or vegetables in your freezer or canned, right? And, you know, trying to choose a variety of foods and not getting stuck in that, having the same 
foods over and over again, um, just to try to make sure that you're more likely to get your nutri nutrients in by having that variety. And again, it's a more limited variety because of the shelf stable and what you have access to, but you know, having the same thing over and over again, if you can avoid that, right, is really trying to think through and be creative. I think one of the cool things that I've seen, lots of people, I mean, Tim mentioned, right, people had recipes that they're exchanging in the grocery store is being creative with how to use those ingredients, right? Instead of just opening that can from the pantry is thinking about how can you be creative with what you prepare to, so. Awesome. Um, Tim or Bacola, do you have a feedback or comment on that? Um, I'll say that information is power, right? So, um, yes, we can have um, in the store where they have foods and cans that are also still very good and fresh, you know, that are preserved that way. But if we talk in terms of getting those foods preserved by yourself, it's about information. Imagine that during the pandemic, we were able to get a lot of updates on our phones where uh, there are all spots for the um, COVID-19. If we are getting information like that, not just from uh, maybe um, USDA, it's just individualized. People are passing information about how they can preserve their foods, what they can do, where they can find such a food pantry, where the food are preserved naturally. Um, that would be another um, idea to buttress um, Meredith's point about, you know, you stock it in your refrigerator or things like that and be creative about stocking varieties. So I would say that when we have information being flashed at people, um, as frequently as we get information on our cell phones, on our, um, on our radios and things like that, even on TV, on how to think about what to, um, a, a different aspect of food. That would be, I'll call it food culture because it's a food culture whereby you want to be proud of yourself having something fresh and locally and being produced, you know, and preserved not in, a, in an industrialized way. And if we have more people doing it, it becomes larger and larger and larger. So I would, that's why I said I'm open to ideas, but this is something we should also think about as well. You know, pandemic has shown us that we need to be thinking in that direction. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Tim, did you have a comment on that as well? Yeah, it's been a commitment of Coburn's for many years. Um, started with the natural foods departments that we integrated into our stores probably over 20 years ago. Um, and if you look at the offerings in our produce departments where there's much more um, packaged, fresh cut vegetables um, to try to make it easier for our consumer when they come into the, the store to get things that they need that will save them time and make eating healthy a little easier for them as they put together their meal after work. Um, so I think that if you look through the store and the buying habits of our consumers prior to the pandemic, there's been a, a, a shift that's been going on for a number of years to eat fresher, eat healthier. And what we do as a retailer is make sure that we have plenty of offerings that help guests make better health choices um, and display them in ways that, that put those things side by side. We have a large organic section in our produce departments. We, our natural foods areas of the store are packed with lots of specialty dietary friendly um, offerings there as well. So you can go in there if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure and find solutions for that. Um, we've had a heavy commitment to um, plant-based meat products and plant-based dairy products to help guests make better choices or healthier choices to help fit certain dietary requirements. Um, I would say that during the pandemic, some of those categories were a little more challenging, but we experienced challenges kind of across the board. Um, I would say that just like other products in our stores, those are continuing to make a recovery and we hope to continue to offer a wide variety of healthy choices to our guests. Awesome. Um, so we have another question for Tim. What changes are you seeing in the retail food sales related to the pandemic and will they stay around after we leave quarantine? Well, if we're talking just basic volume, you know, early when the restaurants and the schools closed, 
um, grocery store volumes um, skyrocketed. You know, there's a national statistic where they measure restaurant sales versus grocery store sales, and they've done this for years. About three, maybe four years ago, restaurant sales surpassed uh, grocery store sales. Um, that has made a dramatic swing the other way um, with the pandemic. And I think that our volumes, as you look across the industry, have have returned to a more normal pace, but I would say that um, more people are eating at home than eating out more frequently. So if they are eating out, it's not probably quite as often as they had in the past, and they've made changes in their household to try to accommodate uh, more cooking at home. I'm not sure if that quite answered the question that you had. Yeah, no, I think that definitely did. Um, I was also curious too, just in terms of what you're hearing um, from manufacturers, you know, you made the comment that Bush's beans, um, you know, you go to the bean section and there's tons of different varieties and different seasoning options with those and they kind of scaled that down to um, less variety. Do you think that that will be a long term trend for manufacturers as we work through the pandemic to kind of streamline or um, limit the number of variety of options that they make to be able to keep supply up of, of all their products? Um, for sure, in the near future, I think that'll be the case. Um, we have seen some quicker than expected recovery in categories like that. Bush um, estimated that it wouldn't be till later this calendar year that they would be offering a much wider variety of products in their lines, but um, they have made a, a more significant recovery than we thought that they'd be able to. We're still seeing some holes in those sections, and this time of year, um, as it starts getting colder up, people make a very sudden switch over to like chili, for example. So that bean section sees a great deal of activity. So it'll be interesting to see how they hold up as we make this transition to cold weather uh, food choices on if they're able to sustain that. I think long term, um, there will be probably some variety cut back, but for the most part, I think that they'll continue to work to um, return to the the full scope of what they had prior to. Okay, great. Um, and then we have another question from Kelly. Is there anything that grocery stores are doing differently this fall to prepare for the likely surge? This is for Tim. And I was also curious if you have any um, idea if there's projections on what items might be surging. Um, toilet paper was the spring, yeast. Are they giving any indication of what's coming down the pipeline so we can all go out and stock up? Well, our company, company implemented, um, at first it was a daily um, call to discuss what the stores were seeing with our corporate leadership. So everybody from uh, store leadership to corporate leadership would jump on a conference call, and that was held daily. Um, that's been scaled back now that we're settled into um, kind of a pattern with the pandemic. So it's twice a week where we're discussing um, what stores are seeing. and. They're filling us in with what, what they're planning for. So our category managers get a voice in that call. Um, and they've been cautiously um, planning for a, another more substantial wave. Um, so what our category managers are doing is, I don't know that we necessarily have a forecast on what the, the item hit will be, but just making sure that we're looking for all types of options. Um, toilet paper, for example, has recovered. We're not seeing all the labels that we're used to, but now napkins have become an issue. Um, we're not seeing our napkin supply um, hold up very well. Um, there was a period of time where um, storage bags, I think as people ran out of canning options, they went to like freezer bags, things like that, facial tissue. We saw um, some issues with supply there. But for the most part, like if we look around the center of the store, they're just um, trying to um, pad our inventory, so to speak, find products that are um, going to be able to help us stock our shelves and meet our guests' needs. And when I work with my team, I'm asking them to plan ahead. I ask them to look for category leaders throughout the store. So if it's, say it's in the coffee section, what's, what's our strongest selling variety of coffee? Well, let's make sure that we have a more than adequate supply of that to help kind of as we head into the holidays, there's going to be more entertaining at home. And I think um, we'll see a sales surge there. 
uh, much different than we've seen in the past. There will be less eating out for those types of events. So my I'm challenging my team to make sure that we're padding some of those key items in each of our categories as we go across the store just to make sure that if, if we do see a second wave um, that we're prepared. And probably staffing is probably one of our other hot buttons right now. We're, we're looking to continue on with some temporary hiring just to make sure that we have staffing. Um, as cases become more prominent in our area, um, we have people that are going out on quarantine just like every other business and doing our best to keep our, um, our staff safe, um, the public safe, and then keep our store running. So we're looking to make sure that we're adding team members to our, our staff. So we're probably looking to over hire by 20 to maybe even 30 employees um, in a store like this just to make sure that we can take care of the, the needs of the public. Wow, no, uh, no easy undertaking with all of the things you described there. So um, wishing you good luck with all of that work. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. I know I have more questions and I'm sure others do too, but we are um, unfortunately getting close to the nine o'clock hour. Um, but we always end every first Fridays with asking each of our speakers, what can the folks that are listening on this call um, do to um, support the message that you shared with us um, and um, be able to take what we've learned and go out and do good in our community to um, support a healthier, um, more resilient, um, better food system for all. So um, Meredith, I'll let you uh, kick that off for us. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, right, just increasing your own understanding about the food supply chain will benefit both the food supply chain as well as you as an individual. And sort of related back to what Tim was just saying, I kind of have a question about, you know, the question posed to him was, what are grocery store chains doing to help prepare for right, a possible surge? I'm curious, what can we as consumers do to help prevent these sort of scarcities, right? Like what, what ideas might he have for what we can all do? Absolutely. Um, Tim, do you want to take that? Meredith kind of reframed the question for you, and I love it. <laughs> well, um, our category managers are working really hard to make sure that we have adequate supplies of core items. We have our own warehouse that we draw from. So, you know, they've um, probably versioned what, what's in that warehouse back to more core items just based off of the potential need if there's a surge can't always count on our vendor partners for all of our needs. So we wanna make sure that we're um, doing some things on our own. Um, all of our retail locations are doing the same. You know, we're um, trying to make sure that we have adequate inventory in the store to hold on to um, some of our inventory levels if there is another surge. And then just staffing, making sure we have people that are able to get products to the shelves, take care of our guests when they come in. Um, I. You know, I think the public has been very understanding with stores like, like mine. Um, there's, uh, we've, we've asked a bit of them as far as like wearing masks and um, they've uh, worked through a number of out of stock issues that, that we've had um, as we work to try to make sure that we have all the offerings, but the public has been very supportive. Our employees have been great. Um, they've uh, kind of been heroes in this whole situation, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Um, all the respect for people that are working on the front lines and have stepped up to a, a huge task and, and done an amazing job. So couldn't agree more. Um, and Bacola, what can we do with the information that you shared to go out um, after today? Yes, we can begin to um, think about what the pandemic, the lesson that he has um, the pandemic has taught us. We could begin to think about how we can um, be more um, assured of our food supply instead of reliance on the food supply chain, um, like the grocery stores. How can we begin to take things into our own hand and disrupt food supply chain in a different way that is more sustainable so that people like Tim could be rest assured that if it runs out in case of a pandemic or whatnot, people have some form of food supplies, even when they are quarantine, um, in quarantine for two weeks. So um, that's my message, how we can begin to think about that, think outside of the block, box, have a culture of food proximity and food supply that are sustainable. Thank you. 
I love it. I love it. Um, you all were fabulous. Such great information and such a diversity of perspectives. So thank you. Um, would everyone online please join me in giving you a virtual round of applause? Um, this was um, fantastic. Um, so we are um, wrapped up for today. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Please watch our Facebook page. Um, we'll upload the full video for everyone to watch. Share it with your friends. This was chock full of so much information. I know I'm definitely going to rewatch it. Um, and then please mark your calendars for our next First Fridays, Friday, November 6th, in recognition of Native American Heritage Month, we are going to have a conversation about Native American foodways. Um, we have David Manuel from Red Lake Nation, Glory Ames um, from White Earth, and she's a student at MSUM, and then Jessica White Plume from Fort Berthold. We're going to talk about some of the different efforts within those communities to revitalize um, traditional food patterns and um, why those food patterns matter. So we're um, really looking forward to that conversation. Thank you all again so much. Have a wonderful weekend and um, stay safe, stay well. Bye. Thanks.